Plains people were not the only ones who suffered as a result of American expansion. Groups like the Utes and the Paiutes were pushed out of the Rocky Mountains by U.S. expansion into Colorado and away from the northern Great Basin by the expanding Mormon population in the Utah Territory in the 1850s and 1860s. The destruction of Indian nations in California and the Pacific Northwest received significantly less attention than the dramatic conquest of the Plains. But natives in these regions also experienced violence and population decline and the loss of their territory. Over a hundred distinct native groups had lived in California before the Spanish and American conquests. But by 1880, the native population of California had collapsed from about 150,000 on the eve of the gold rush to fewer than 20,000. And in 1872, the California-Oregon border erupted in violence when the Modoc people left the reservation of their historic enemies, the Klamath Indians, and returned to an area known as Lost River. White Americans had settled in the region after the Modocs had been removed, and they complained bitterly of the natives' return. The U.S. military arrived when 52 Modoc warriors, led by a man called Captain Jack, refused to return to the reservation and hold up in defensive positions along the state border. They fought a guerrilla war for 11 months in which at least 200 U.S. troops were killed before they were finally forced to surrender. Four years later, in the Pacific Northwest, a branch of the Nez Perce, who generations earlier had aided Lewis and Clark in their famous journey to the Pacific Ocean, refused to be moved to a reservation and under the leadership of Chief Joseph, attempted to flee to Canada. Pursued by the U.S. Cavalry, the outnumbered Nez Perce battled across a thousand miles and were attacked nearly two dozen times before they finally succumbed to hunger and exhaustion and surrendered and were forced to return. The transcript of Chief Joseph's surrender, recorded by a U.S. Army officer, became a landmark in American rhetoric. Hear me, my chiefs, Joseph said. I am tired. My heart is sick and sad. From where the sun now stands, I will fight no more forever. As Americans moved into the West, the situation for Native groups just continued to deteriorate. Treaties negotiated between the U.S. and Native peoples had typically promised that if the tribes agreed to move to reservation lands, they could hold those lands collectively. But as American westward migration continued and open lands and the frontier closed, white settlers began to argue that the Indians had too much, had more than their fair share. The reservations, they said, were too big, and the Indians were using the land, quote-unquote, inefficiently. They still preferred nomadic hunting instead of intensive farming and ranching. By the 1880s, many Americans championed legislation to allow the transfer of Indian lands to white farmers and ranchers. They argued that allotting Indian lands to individual Native Americans rather than to bands and tribes would encourage American-style agriculture and finally put the Indians who had previously resisted the efforts of missionaries and federal officials onto the path towards civilization. This argument really masked the hope that individual Indians could be convinced or cajoled or threatened into selling their parcels where the tribal communities could not. The Dawes General Allotment Act, passed by Congress on February 8, 1887, splintered most Native reservations into individual family homesteads. Each head of an Indian household was allotted 160 acres the same size of the claim that any white settler could make on federal lands under the provisions of the Homestead Act. Single individuals over age 18 would receive an 80-acre allotment and orphaned children got 40 acres. A four-year timeline was established for Indian people to make their allotment selections. If no selection had been made in four years, then the Secretary of the Interior would appoint an agent to make selections for the remaining tribal members. To protect the Indians from being swindled by unscrupulous land speculators, the act stated that all allotments would be held in trust and could not be sold by the allottees for 25 years. Lands that remained unclaimed by tribal members after the allotment would revert to federal control and could be sold to American settlers.
Conquest throughout the 19th century had displaced generations of Native Americans. Many of them began taking comfort in the words of Indian prophets and holy men. In Nevada, at the beginning of 1889, a northern Paiute prophet named Wavoka experienced a great revelation. He told his people, you must not hurt anybody or do harm to anyone. You must not fight. Do right always. And they must also, he said, participate in a religious ceremony that became known as the ghost dance. If the people lived justly and danced the ghost dance, Wavoka said, their ancestors would rise from the dead, droughts would dissipate, and the whites in the West would vanish, and the buffalo would once again roam the plains. Wavoka's prophecy spread quickly among the Paiutes. From across the West, members of the Arapaho and Bannock and Cheyenne and Shoshone nations adopted the ghost dance. Perhaps the most avid ghost dancers were the Lakota. South Dakota, which had been formed out of the land that had once belonged to them and had later been part of the Great Sioux Reservation, became a state in 1889. White homesteaders had poured in, reservation lands had continued to diminish, starvation had set in, and corrupt or inept federal officials had cut food rations, and then drought had hit the plains. Many Lakota feared a future as landless subjects of a growing American empire. The message and the energy of the ghost dance revival frightened U.S. Indian agents, who began arresting Indian leaders. Chief Sitting Bull was killed, as I mentioned, in December 1890, because Indian agents were afraid he was going to lead the ghost dance. And this convinced many bands to flee the reservations and to join the fugitives farther west, where Lakota adherents of the ghost dance began claiming that ghost dancers would be immune from bullets. Two weeks after Sitting Bull's killing, a reconstituted 7th Cavalry intercepted a band of 350 Lakotas, including over 100 women and children. They were escorted to Wounded Knee Creek, where they camped for the night. The following morning, December 29th, American troops entered the camp to disarm the Indians. Tensions flared, a shot was fired, no one's entirely sure by whom, and a massacre ensued. The 7th Cavalry fired heavy weaponry, including Hotchkiss light cannons, indiscriminately into the camp. Two dozen cavalrymen were killed, supposedly by the Lakota's concealed weapons, but also possibly by friendly fire. And when the guns were finally silent, between 150 and 300 native men, women, and children were dead. Wounded Knee marked the end of sustained armed Native American resistance in the 19th century in the West. Individuals continued to resist the pressures of assimilation and to try to preserve their traditional cultural practices. But the final decades of the 19th century were marked by sustained military defeats, loss of sovereignty over land and resources, and crippling poverty, disease, and starvation on reservations. This is a particularly dark era for America's Western tribes. However, for white Americans, of course, it became mythical. So before I continue with how mythical it was for the white Americans, some questions. First, why was it important, do you think, for the U.S. to capture Chief Joseph as he was trying to lead his people to escape into Canada? Second, what was the most important effect of the Dawes Act? Third, were white authorities right to be afraid of the ghost dance? And then finally, why has Wounded Knee become such a potent image of injustice toward Native people?